Hey guys, and welcome back to another video from The Modern Vet, AKA Dr. Armstrong. We're doing another Navly question today provided to you by Vet Prep. Thank you, Vet Prep. So I am gonna just jump right into it. It's been a while since I've done a question that was longer than a few sentences. Every now and then the Navly will kind of just hit you like a gently punch in the back of the head with a question that's like an entire paragraph and they have an image that is attached to the question. So it's like a lot to process. And you're already nervous during the exam. And so you're gonna be seeing like a whole thesis that you have to read through. And then an image is like, oh my goodness. So we are gonna practice just that kind of question. And we're just gonna read through the question, dissect it. And as we're doing that, the same principles apply, the same principles that I've talked about in other videos as far as like going through the answer choices and ruling this one in and ruling this one out, etc. So really what it boils down to is knowing the difference between what is pertinent information from what is just considered fluff or, you know, useless information, obviously as it pertains to the exam. For the most part, every detail you know, is important on the clinic floor, but for the sake of the exam, especially when it's an entire paragraph, you know that they're not expecting you to like utilize every single bit of information and synthesize that information in like 20 seconds. So again, it's all about strategy, all right? So let's begin. While sorting cattle with his owner yesterday, a two-year-old intact male blue healer named Tucker was kicked by one of the cows. Today, he presents to you in respiratory distress. He has an orthopnic posture and a respiratory pattern of shallow, rapid breaths with an abdominal component. His temperature is 104.1 degrees Fahrenheit. His heart rate is 220 beats per minute. His respiratory rate is 110 beats per minute. His mucous membranes are pale pink and his CRT or capillary refill time is 1.5 seconds. His systolic blood pressure is 135 millimeters of mercury. There's an obvious area of bruising and edema on his left thorax and an abrasion on the left side of his face. Tucker is very distressed and anxious, so you give an intramuscular injection of butorphanol to help calm him enough for thoracic radiographs and then place him on oxygen supplementation via face mask. The lateral radiograph is shown below. CBC chemistry profiles were unremarkable. Blood gas analysis documents hypoxemia and a respiratory acidosis. What is the next best step? Oh my gosh. So we are gonna break all of this down. We're gonna deconstruct it to the bones. Once upon a time, there was a dog named Tucker, a blue healer. We know those dogs are used to going in the pasture, hanging out with the cows. Not really all that important. Be that as it may, Tucker got a little too caught up in his job. He got kicked by one of the cows and his owner didn't take him in to the vet that same day because I don't know. Needless to say, the next day, the owner woke up and was like, oh my gosh, you're breathing funny. And so he swiftly took Tucker to the hospital. Tucker was not right. Tucker was breathing fast. He was having increased respiratory rates. He was looking all kinds of sick. So the doctors were like, Mm, we need to get some chest x-rays because we have to figure out what's going on with Tucker. So you're like, it's okay, I'm going to sedate him a little bit so he can relax. I'm going to take these x-rays and oh my gosh, look at these x-rays. So now let's get some blood work. Oh my goodness, we ran a CBC, CBC was fine. We did a chemistry, chemistry is fine. But look at that blood gas, hypoxemia, what? And your respiratory acidosis? Well, it kind of makes sense because you're breathing like this. <laughs> Therefore, the carbon dioxide can't really get out the way it should, so it's kind of building up. And as you remember from my other videos, carbon dioxide is an acid. Be that as it may, what's the next step? Now let's look at these answer choices. Number one, thoracocentesis of the right side only, surgical correction of the disease, placement of continuous suction thoracostomy tube, thoracocentesis on the left side only, or bilateral thoracocentesis. All right, guys, now we're gonna get into exam mode. The clock is ticking. Let's go through the question one more time in a serious fashion and kind of pick apart the question and figure out what we need to hold on to and what we have to throw out the window. While sorting cattle with his owner yesterday, we don't need to know all of that. So we're gonna just keep it moving. A two-year-old intact male blue healer, so that's our signalman, named Tucker, we don't care about his name, was kicked by one of the cows. He could have been kicked by a goat. It doesn't really matter, but we know that he sustained some trauma. Today, he presents you in respiratory distress. All right, it doesn't matter. It could have been a week later, could have been the same day, but all we know is he's in respiratory distress. 
He has an orthotomic posture and a respiratory pattern of shallow, rapid breaths with an abdominal component, which basically means orthopnea. Remember, they kind of position their front legs like this and they're kind of trying to open up their chest cavity so that they can kind of breathe a little better, right? So that supports the fact that he's in respiratory distress. They're just giving you a little bit more details. We don't really need all the details. We already know he can't breathe properly. But his temperature is high, his heart rate's high, and his respiratory rate is high. So we know those three things. What does that mean? Number one, clearly he's uncomfortable. He can't really breathe. So you can imagine you can't breathe. <sighs> What's going to happen? You're working yourself up. Your temperature is going to go up. Your heart rate's going up. And obviously your respiratory rate's up. Now, for, as far as the temperature is concerned, sure, it could be some kind of infection, inflammation. Absolutely. We can't really rule that out just yet. But we know if a dog's in respiratory distress or a human and you're really struggling to breathe, yes, your heart rate's gonna go sky high. Yes, your respiratory rate is gonna go sky high. And of course, your temperature as well. So we get some more information about blood pressure. We see what his CRT is like. There's an obvious area of bruising and edema on his left thorax, which suggests right off the bat that more than likely that was where he sustained his injury. So on the chest, we already know he's in respiratory distress. Let's keep that in the back of our head. And he has a cut on the left side of his face. Use this information. Tucker is very distressed and he's anxious. All right, he's distressed, we already know that. He's anxious, we already know that. You give him an injection of Torb to help calm him down to take x-rays and to place him in oxygen. So that whole spiel, that's really not that important, that's fluff. Yes, in the real world, in the clinical setting, that is very important because we do need to take x-rays at some point, but we need to sedate our patient and we need to make sure that they have oxygen, etc. But for the sake of this question, right now, knowing that you did all these things, I don't really need to know that. What I need to know is the data so that I can answer these questions. So now we jump into the x-ray. They say, look at the x-ray. What do you see? What do you see? They tell us next that some blood work was done, the complete blood cell count is normal, so that high temperature is more than likely supported by his respiratory distress. It has nothing to do with his elevated white blood cell count because his white blood cells are normal, all right? Um, he also had a blood gas analysis performed and it showed that he was hypoxemic, all right? Remember his mucous membranes are kind of pale and he is also in a respiratory acidosis. Going back, remember his breathing is short, shallow breath. So, all right, so is he able to get rid of all his carbon dioxide? No, he's not able to get rid of his CO2. And remember, CO2 is an acid, so it's building up. And now we kind of have to ask ourselves, well, why is he breathing like this? So now we look at the x-rays and we see that there is some space in between the sternum and his heart. So right where that cardiac silhouette is and the sternum, there's just way too much space. And if you look at the opacity, it's very gas-like. So if I, without spending too much time, because remember the clock is ticking, I look and I see all the space between the sternum and the cardiac silhouette, I'm like, oh my gosh, this dog probably has a pneumothorax, which would make sense because he did sustain trauma. And remember how he's breathing. <laughs> So with all this air surrounding his lungs, his lungs have very limited capacity to expand. So that's gonna force him to breathe like this. <sighs> and then when we look more cranially, we say, oh my gosh, is that a bulla? I don't know. But you know what? We, do we really need to get into all the radiographic interpretive details? Not really, because we've seen enough. We see that this dog has a pneumothorax and that is why he's having issues breathing. Now we're gonna run into our answer choices again and now we're gonna try to rule things out. So, are we going to perform thoracocentesis on the right side only? Hmm, I mean, we know we have to remove the, the free air from the chest, but is it just one side? And how do we know which side versus the other, especially given this one view? I don't know, man, let's just keep going. Surgical correction of the disease. Well, what disease does this dog have? I mean, he does have a pulmonary pathology, which is pneumothorax, too much air in the lungs. And why are we gonna surgically correct this? Like it says the next best step. Remember, the next best step is super important because even if this dog had a reason to go under the knife, is that the next best step? Number one, this dog isn't even stable. So no, surgical correction, let's just eliminate it. Placement of continuous suction thoracostomy tube. If you remember from lecture, anytime there's indication for thoracocentesis, 
we always, well, for the most part, it really depends on the doctor, but generally speaking, three strikes are out. So if I have to tap that chest three times, that means that by the fourth time, I see that there is a need for me to remove more air. It's like, you know what? I'm not tapping again. I'm going to place a chest tube. So is that placement of the chest tube the next best step, knowing that I haven't even tapped anything? No. So we're going to chuck that answer choice out the window as well. The is on the left side only. All right, so why just the left side? Remember, that was my first option, thoracocentesis on the right side. Why just the right side and not the left? Why just the left side and not the right? I only have one view to work with. I don't know which side I should tap, right? So let's keep moving. I'm not gonna chuck that answer. I'm just gonna just keep moving. So my last option is bilateral thoracocentesis. Now, clock is ticking, I've eliminated two answer choices, and now I have three left. Tapping the chest on the left, only. Tapping the chest on the right, only. Or tapping both sides. If I have five seconds left, what am I gonna pick? I'm probably gonna pick tapping both sides, bilateral thoracocentesis. Why? Because, number one, I only have one view, a right lateral. So whenever you're on the right side, that means that more of the left side on the lung is being shown, right? I don't have the other view to, to give me an idea of what's going on on the other side of the chest, right? So I don't wanna assume that the other side isn't going to need any tapping. I only have one view. Am I gonna just assume that, oh, because I've taken a right lateral and the left side shows that there is a pneumothorax, I'm not gonna tap the right. No, I'm gonna tap both sides of that chest to be on the safe side, all right? There is no strong indication that only one side of the chest must be tapped. Therefore, the next best step or the best answer is to tap both sides. Tapping just one side is too, I mean, that's a little too confident. So I'm, I'm not going to because there's no inv indication that one side must be tapped and not the other. Placing a chest tube as a next best step, absolutely not. Like. I have to tap it first. And then after one, two, three taps, at that point, I will place a chest tube if I find that the dog is still having issues breathing because more air is still collecting in that chest, more free air. Surgical correction of the issue, I'm not gonna do that as my next step. That would only be after I've tapped three times, after I place a chest tube and I'm still finding that the dog is filling up with air, at that point, and once the patient is stable, and once I've confirmed that yes, I need to go in and correct this surgically, at that point will I consider surgery. But that is not going to be the next best step. So, bilateral thoracocentesis. I really hope that makes sense. And as you can see, there are ways to just kind of chop, chop, chop through all the fluff in the question and get straight to the point and figure out what high yield information you need. All right, guys, so I really hope this video has helped you and made you feel a little less intimidated by the depth of the questions that are sometimes seen in these exams. If you have any questions at all, please let me know and I will see you in the next video. Bye.